I'll have to ask her. Well, you could ask her. Well, <laughs> we'll see. I may do that. Okay. Anyway. Oh, now this thing. Okay. I think it's live. Hmm. Um, this is an exam. This is a uh, recording lecture for my, uh, I don't think this is working. Anyway, <laughs> for my third hour class on the 14th of February. All right. So. Alexander Graham Bell was in Boston, and in 1876, you know, he'd been testing these phones, trying to invent this phone, this device to carry uh, sound waves, and he finally succeeded in 1876, and if you think of all the millions of, uh, and by the way, there's the first phone, imagine putting that in your back pocket, but there's the first phone, and there he is uh, using it, the first phone, okay? But <laughs> think of all the trillions of phone conversations that have happened. I mean, billions that have happened just today. Uh, and the very first uh, phone conversation, he was in his laboratory and he had an assistant in the other room and they'd been testing out, trying to test out this phone. And he had some acid for another experiment, I guess, acid mixed up with water, and he accidentally hit that and spilled in his lap. And he said, this is the first phone conversation in history. He said, Mr. Watson, that's his assistant, and the, you know, just on the other side of that door, Mr. Watson, come here, I want you. Uh, and that's the first telephone conversation of the trillions that have happened since then. So Alexander Graham Bell, remember him, you knew that before I told you about him, but anyway, he, an immigrant who invented that thing that we cannot do without the telephone. And then Henry Ford, write him down. <coughs> Henry, <coughs> Henry Ford, there he is. He's not an immigrant, but his parents were. They were from Ireland. But Henry Ford, as Miss Pippinger, I think, pointed out yesterday, he didn't invent the first automobile. He's often accused of that. You know, Henry Ford, oh, yeah, that's it. He didn't invent that. In fact, the very first... Automobile, I think I've got a picture of this guy. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, you've heard of Mercedes Benz. It was, he was a German uh, inventor and he invented uh, Carl Friedrich Benz uh, in 1886, uh, invented the uh, first gasoline fueled internal combustion engine. And I think uh, there it is. That, that's literally the first automobile. That's, I guess, the first Benz, uh, Mercedes Benz. On the heels of that, though, in 1896, about 10 years later, maybe I've got, yeah, there, there he is. Okay, there's one of those in action, okay, driving down the street. So that's 1886. That's the first gas-powered vehicle, okay? But on the heels of that, Henry Ford invented that, okay, which is just a carriage with an engine. He called it, in fact, a uh, horseless a carriage. Uh, I guess the official name of the official name of it uh, was uh, the quadricycle. Okay, that was the first car quadricycle, the first car uh, created by Henry Ford, and it's just a horseless carriage. It had a one-cylinder engine. Your right, your Craftsman lawnmower is probably more powerful, but it had a one-cylinder engine. It had solid rubber tires. Uh, rather than a steering wheel, you can see there was no steering wheel. There was a tiller, okay, almost like you would have in your boat. There was no reverse. The thing was really light. If you turned down a dead-end street and yeah, you had to turn around and go back, uh, it seats two people. Two people could easily get up, pick it up, and turn it around, uh, then get back in and restart it and go on, on your way. Uh, the top speed was about 20 miles an hour. If you drive sometime without driving and you're in a hurry to go somewhere, or drive home from school today going 20 miles an hour. You'll be insane after about five minutes. Uh, in fact, but people couldn't believe that you could go 20 miles an hour. You know, with a horse team, a good pulling team, you might go three or four miles an hour, but now you could actually go 20 miles an hour. And Henry Ford, to demonstrate his new invention, drove all the way from uh, Pittsburgh to New York City, which is about 327 miles. It's about from you follow the, it's a distance from about you follow to Kansas City, and how long did it take him? And the world was amazed that he did it in such a short time. How long did it take him to go from here to Kansas City? Two days. Two days? Two weeks. Two weeks? Well, somewhere between that. It took him eight days, okay, 
how long would it take you to drive from here to Kansas City? Well, if you took off right now, you could eat dinner in Kansas City, okay? Uh, you could eat dinner in Kansas City. But in, so that's his first. But in 1908, he invented, I think, uh, his most uh, famous car, and that was the Model T. Get, this, get that down, the Model T. There, there's another one, the horseless carriage. There's Henry Ford in a horseless carriage, his own invention. That's not it. Right there. That's the, that's the T. That's the Model T. And I, I think that's the most famous car that Ford ever produced, although Mustangs are right up there, too. And I'm talking about the old 63 through 66 Mustangs, not these monstrosities they have today. <coughs> but anyway, uh, this started with a crank. There was a crank in it, and you had to get it out and stick it in there. And uh, you would turn the ignition on. You'd have someone in there. And you just kind of swing it like that, and all of a sudden you'd pop it and pop it up. And you usually had to do that a couple of times. It was pretty tricky. Most people never drove a Model T. That thing would kick back, had a habit of kicking back on you, and they either broke their hand or broke their wrist, or they might have broken their arm uh, at one time or another. But and and by the way, on cold, you know, people kept it out in the barn. Uh, on cold days, you had to go out and build a fire under it to heat the oil pan before it would start. And a lot of people would, you know, build a fire under it out there in the barn, go back in to have one more cup of coffee, and uh, they would look out and the whole barn would be consumed in flames. Okay, a couple of accidents like that happened. But get this down. This invention revolutionized America. Uh, life in America was never the same again after the Model T. You know, there are five great agents of social change, I believe, in American history. They are in, the, in their appearance, the automobile, the radio, the television, uh, the computer, and the iPhone. I think those five things are the five great uh, 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 ingredients of social change in America. Uh, it's hard to imagine, that uh, for us to imagine anyway, that up until Henry Ford and his little car called, and it's very lightweight, the wind blew him off the road all the time. I've ridden in one of those, you know, it's quite an experience, but anyway, uh, it's uh, the wind would blow them off uh, the, the highway. Uh, so they're a light car, but it's hard for us to believe that before this Model T, uh, many Americans had never traveled more than 50 miles from home. There were a lot of Americans that lived to be 80 years old and they never went from Shakota to uh, Eufaula. Okay, never, never traveled more than 10 miles away from home. Well, Henry Ford changed all that. This is what it is not the first automobile, but get this down. Uh, Henry Ford made America a mobile society, and we are still today. We are constantly on the go, a mobile society. You know, by 1890, there were very few cars, 1890. In a town the size of Eufaula, there might be one. And when the family got in that car to go down Main Street to go to the train station, the whole town would gather on Main Street just to see this, just to see this car go by. Uh, most automobiles by, uh, before the Model T were like this right here. One of the things you don't have to worry about, you know, teenagers have a lot to worry about. But one of the things you don't have to worry about is ever getting hit by a Stutz Bearcat. That's what that is. And those Stutz Bearcats were made by hand. A group of technicians got together and they put it together piece by piece. And because of that, uh, most Americans couldn't afford one. If you owned one of these things, a Stutz Bearcat, it would be like owning today your own private jet. Yeah, there are people that have private jets. Most of us don't. Or a Bugatti, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which they say is it costs you $1.5 million. Does that sound right? A car for $1.5 million? Have you heard that? Yeah. Well, yeah, I've got this. The Bugatti Devo, I hope I'm pronouncing that, is $8 million. You know, eight million dollars. So most people, only the super, super rich can afford that. Well, most people couldn't afford this. But then came Henry Ford, got this down. And this is what Henry Ford revolutionized the automobile industry. And here's what he did. He had an idea. I keep telling you this. He had an idea that nobody else had. He took the lessons <coughs> Pardon me. He took the lessons of the Industrial Revolution, get this down, and he applied them to the automobile industry. Instead of having 12 guys over here putting this thing 
piece by piece together. Henry Ford builds automobile plants, and in it, he puts assembly lines. And on those assembly lines, there are machines. And those machines have what? <laughs> Interchangeable parts. And he is mass producing automobiles. Nobody had ever done that. Nobody had ever done that. And by the way, get this down. He's mass producing these cars. He's outselling everyone else. And for the first time in American history, thanks to Mr. Ford, most Americans could own a car. The man who put America behind the steering wheel was Henry Ford. He took a great risk, but as I say, or as the Romans said, who dares wins. Nobody was ever great at anything. I don't care what it is. Nobody was ever great at anything that didn't take a risk. And Henry Ford is a perfect example of that. He built cars cheaper and faster than anyone else. The more he sold, the cheaper they became, just like computers and cell phones. Uh, I remember when computers came out to buy a computer, a, a person, and they didn't even have internet. Uh, it cost you $2,000. What what's the cheapest you can buy a computer for now? Two, two, huh? I was going to say like $500. Really? Well, a bit, a bit still, if it's that, from 2500 down to 500 that would be quite a price drop. But I think you can buy one for 250 bucks. Just a computer. I think you can. 300 Does that sound reasonable? Okay, yeah. Well, Ford did the same thing with auto Ford did the same thing with automobiles. Uh, look, the first Model T's in 1908, the first one he put on the highway, this one, that cost in 1908 $825. And so well, that's not much. Most Americans at the time were making about $400 a year if you worked in a factory. <coughs> if you worked in Henry Ford's factory, you were making about, so it was two years' salary, okay? It was two years' salary. Um, but by the 1920s, he keeps mass producing these things. In fact, by the 1920s, every 10 seconds, a completed, this is, this is how big the demand was. Every 10 seconds, a completed Model T was rolling off the assembly line. And he still couldn't keep up with the demand. He still wasn't producing enough cars. So guess what the price had dropped from 1908 to the 1920s? The 12 years. In 12 years, the price dropped from 425, 400 and, uh, or, excuse me, $825 a year to 265, uh, 800, let me back up, $825 per car in 1908. That's the same car cost you $265 in 1920, okay? quite a substantial uh, price drop. And of course, Americans, we have all become addicted to automobiles. Our society could not do, could not function without them. Uh, just like we have become addicted to iPhones. I don't think our society can function without them. We just can't live without them. By the way, what do you think gasoline was? Uh, in 1908, if you bought your brand new Model T, you went in debt, a two year salary, $825, and you pulled up to the gas station. By the way, they didn't have gas stations. The general store would have barrels of gasoline and you would dip it out and pour it in at first. What were you paying a gallon? Five cents. Three cents. Okay. Three cents a gallon. So America took to the road, <coughs> took to the road, and we've never stopped. And by the way, the automobile, get this down, made this country smaller. Before the Model T, if you took off from Eufaula to go to McAllister to take care of business in a wagon, I know in the movies they have these jet-propelled horses and they race all over. But in a wagon, if you took off, uh, you better plan to be gone a day and a half. Just to go to McAllister and back, okay, a day and a half. Now you could do it in an hour. Now you could do it in an hour, about an hour, 20 miles an hour, about an hour. Take care of your business. In two and a half hours, you could be back and you follow. That, the automobile made this country uh, smaller. Uh, but, of course, technology comes with a price. We have this technology called Facebook. What price have we paid to have Facebook? It's the end of privacy. I remember privacy. I remember. I wish it was. we still had it. We don't anymore. <clears throat> but you've never had it. Never, ever, ever. 
uh, the computer, the phone, uh, email, Facebook, all these things you have, that privacy will never return. You'll never know what it was like. I'm old enough to remember that. There are some advantages of being old, I guess. Uh, the automobile, just like Facebook, created all sorts of problems. This country, what is it? This country became addicted to oil. In fact, we've literally sent our young men and women to die in wars in the Middle East to secure that oil coming out of the Middle East. By the way, how many people are killed every day in automobile? How many people are killed every day from fentanyl? 90. 90. How many are killed in automobile accidents every day? 90. 90 a day. That's 38,000 38, per year. Imagine if ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the Taliban was killing 90 Americans a day. The nation would be in an uproar. Listen to this. Since 9-11 which uh, the worst year that we've experienced since 9-11, the worst year that we've experienced for people being killed by terrorists was in 2014. You have to write this down. Just I'm just illustrating a point. It was in 2014. And that year in 2014, terrorists killed 25,000 people worldwide. And the world was shocked by that. We were at war status in this country. How many people every year are killed in automobile accidents worldwide? A million and a half. A million and a half. What if Al-Qaeda, what if the Taliban was killing a million and a half innocent people? So, uh, you know, which is the greater danger? What is the greatest threat to you living a long life? Is it Al-Qaeda? Is it terrorism? Or that automobile you just can't wait to get in to get your grimy hands on that steering wheel and take off. What's the greatest threat to your health and happiness, the automobile or terrorists? But anyway, on we go. Uh, the typical American will drive the distance. You will. You're just starting your driving career. The typical American will drive the distance to the moon and back in their lifetime. That's 300,000, close to 300,000 miles okay so the automobile uh product of the guild today oh there we go that's that's the eight million dollar car they say the bugatti devo if you had eight million dollars would you buy that i wouldn't i wouldn't god almighty because at the end of the day what is it it's fiberglass on four rubber tires i can think of a lot of things to do with eight million dollars that ain't one up. Look at all those people standing back there anyway. Yeah, there it is. Write these two guys down. Orville and Wilbur Wright. And spell their name correctly. I want you to put on a test. Orville and Wilbur Wright. Okay, your sophomores. You ought to spell correctly. Orville and Wilbur Wright. W-R-I-G-H-T. And these two men began the conquest of space. Okay. We're talking now about sending uh, men and women to the moon again. We have it since 1969. Uh, but they, these two men, again, they did something that no one else had ever done. They flew. Write that down. They flew. You know, humans had been talking about flying since the ancient Greeks for 2,000 years before these guys were born. The Greeks and others, not just the Greeks, but they saw the birds fly and said, you know, why can't we do that? The Greeks even had a story about a boy that flew and didn't follow the instruction. You've heard that Icarus? Icarus? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a 2,500-year-old story. I mean, to come up with that story, you have to have in your head, someday the human race will fly. So people have been talking about it for 2,500 years. These guys actually, actually did it. And to do it, by the way, they literally risk their lives. They literally risk their lives. Who were they? The Wright brothers. Uh, they were owners of a bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. That's what they did. The bicycle was also coming in during the Gilded Age. <clears throat> and as a hobby, this was what they did in their spare time. Some people play golf. Some people fish. The Wright brothers were trying to build an apparatus that would fly. And they built one. Their plane was called... The fly, the fly. And you can go, let's see if I've got a picture of it. There it is. 
There it is. That's it. You can go in the uh, American History Museum of the Smithsonian Institution, and you can go in and you see these people lined up here. And you just walk around. Yeah, there's so many people that want to see that. You can't really stop and look. you just got to keep moving. At a, but you can go around as many times as you want. That's as I tell if I'm going to have students up there in May. Once I tell students, that's not a replica. That's not something built to say, well, this is what the right, that's it. Okay, that's it. That is that. Okay, plane. Okay. And the name of the plane was the flyer. And the first flight in history took place, get this down, on December 17th, 1903. Where? You know, if you read uh, license plates, <coughs> you know, they have slogans. <coughs> I think we need to change ours. <coughs> Oklahoma's okay. That's not too, that's okay. That's not too, but uh, Delaware, I think, has first and freedom. They were the first state, of the 13, to approve or ratify the Constitution. So they win that. Uh, North Carolina has first in flight. And if you look at their license tags, they'll have that plane flying on it, usually. Okay, first in flight. The f first flight in history took place out on the coast. That's the Atlantic Ocean out there, by the way, at a place called Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Okay, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And the plane was the flyer. And of course, like I say, every chance, you know, the Wright brothers are from Ohio. Every chance they got, uh, they would come down and uh, try and fly, fly their plane. By the way, their plane <clears throat> had a 13 horsepower engine. Really, that's not much more powerful than your riding lawnmower. It was a biplane. You can see it had two sets of wings. The wingspan was 40 feet, uh, twice the length of the plane. The actual body of the plane uh, was only 21 feet long. Uh, and the pilot, you see, didn't sit up in it. That's the actual. That's the actual first flight taking place right there. He didn't sit up in it. He laid down, and he had hand controls. Uh, I wonder if this, if they could put uh, in this. Uh... Yeah, there you see. That's they put that mannequin in there up at the museum. But there he is. That's that's how he flew the plane. Okay. Um, but um, anyway. Anyway, um, they had gone down there many, many, many times to try and get the thing to fly. And on December 17th, 1903, uh, they had tried, I think, four, three times that day to get it up, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't leave the ground. And, you know, you can see the weather's kind of cloudy. You know, the sea's kind of churning out there. It's kind of a misty, wet uh, day, kind of like a windy day. Uh, and so at 12 o'clock noon, they decided, well, we'll, we'll try one more time. Uh, we'll try one more time and then we know we'll pack the thing up and go home and come back later. Uh, so they're going to try this final time. And they felt like they were so close to getting the thing to fly. They never knew when it was going to take off. And of course, both of them wanted to be the first person to fly. And just in case it flew this time, this would be the fourth attempt that day. Just in case it flew, they flipped a coin to see who would pilot, who would pilot the plane and, uh, Orville. Orville Wright was, uh, won the toss, I guess you could say. And this time the plane took off at 12 noon on December. The age of flight was born at 12 noon on December 17th, 1903. He did something that no one else had ever done. He flew and the first flight lasted 59 seconds. Uh, and it was, the plane flew the, the length of 800 and 52 feet, about a half mile, about a half mile. <clears throat> okay, about a half mile. Uh, and that was the first flight in history. And listen, 66 years later, and that's just one lifetime, you know, that, 66, you know, well, I'll put it to you this way. 66 years later, in 1969, we walked on the moon. There were people alive who remembered Orville and Wilbur uh, Wright's flight back in 19, 1903. So uh, we walked on the moon, and we haven't since. 
There's only one flag on the moon. It's the United States, the flag of the United States. There's a brass plaque up there saying that men from Earth came here in 19, August of 1969. And I think we're about to put another one up there. We're already, you know, testing the rockets and that sort of thing. And this time they're going to have, maybe it'll, it might be an all woman crew, but they're going to certainly include women uh, to walk to walk on the moon. You know, after we did that, Russia said, we're going to do it. They never did. China has been saying for years, we're going to do it. We're going to land on the moon. We're going to the moon. Never, never have done it yet. Okay, well, I've got this down then. Uh, not only did these inventions make life easier, but for many people, and again, I'm speaking in broad general terms. I don't want to read too much into this. But for many people, the work day was shortened. In other words, people had spare time or what we often like to call leisure time on their hands. They had periods where there was just really uh, not much to do. And if you give people leisure time, they will usually come up with something to occupy that time. And what they came up with, get this down, uh, in the Gilded Age is college and professional sports, college and professional sports which by the way is a multi-trillion dollar industry today, college and professional sports. Would you say that college and here, here the couple of days after the Super Bowl, would you say that college and, and professional sports are important in this culture that we're in? Yes. What's the next great event in college and professional sports coming up that the country's going to go absolutely mad over? March Madness. March Madness. When does that start? Spring break? Will it be going on during spring break? I don't know. I don't, I don't, anyway, <coughs> anyhow, spring break. So. Okay, well, get your bets in early. No, just kidding. Don't gamble. Anyway, they, um, uh, you know, it's, it's 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 huge. I mean, uh, you know, sports, and, and that's really a good thing. And it's it's but but the beginning of college and professional sports uh, is the Gilded Age. And of course, which sport uh, it no longer does, but which sport dominated? Uh, the culture in the eight, the guild from about the middle of the Gilded Age on until the 1960s. Baseball. Baseball. Write that down. Look at that. Look at that picture. I want you to write this down. The New York Yankees <laughs> are the greatest team. Yes, they are. Don't shake your head at me. The New York Yankees are the greatest team in the history of baseball. There will never be a baseball team greater than the New York Yankees. We should all worship at the altar of the New York Yankees. What are you grinning about? Well, what is your team, by the way? Red Sox. Oh, really? Well, that's good. Uh, get your stuff. Get your stuff. Uh, you can take my car. The key's in it. Go tell your mother you're not going to do very well in American history. Jesus, the Boston Red Sox. Look, there's the greatest team. <laughs> and look at this. Write this down. The Boston Red Sox are the worst <laughs> and most evil team. Well, no, scratch that. Put this down. Hitler played third base for the Boston Red Sox. Okay. Look at that. Mm. You know, when I was searching for that picture, I found that. And I didn't know if that was a jailbreak or a football, a baseball team. My God. Anyway, Boston. Coach Green, that's his favorite team. Coach Green, he's a fellow Boston, Bostonian Red Sox. Yes, yes. He was dropped on his head when he was a small child <laughs> and never recovered. But anyway, <clears throat> you all can talk together. Anyway, Boston. Anyway, uh, baseball. Uh, had evolved, you know, it didn't start in the Gilded Age. It, it had evolved as far back as the Revolutionary War. In fact, even earlier than that, it came from an Irish-English game called Rounders. And Rounders was sort of like baseball. Uh, it was played as far back as Tudor, <laughs> Tudor, England. That would be the 1500s. Tudors, Henry VIII. We're in the same ballpark here. You know what I'm talking about, Henry VIII. How many wives did he have? Eight. That's why they called him Henry VIII. No, he had six. Okay, he had six wives. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, <clears throat> he's buried next to his favorite wife out of the six because she was the only one who gave him a live son. 
anyway, they were playing baseball in his day. And the game they played back in Tudor, England. You know, that was his, his dynastic name. You don't have to write this down, but Tudor, okay? I've had people write when I taught world history, Tudor. Uh, that's not it. Tudor, okay, England. But, uh, it, uh, you know, we reminded you of base. It had nine players, four bases. And they had a leather-covered ball. They had bats. They had rest periods. I guess you could call that innings. And uh, the goal of the thing was to hit the ball and run around, around the bases. When the Pilgrims came here from England in 1620, guess what? Their little kids pro- played baseball. George Washington's Army during the Revolutionary War and the British Army during the Revolutionary War, they took time out and played baseball. During the Civil War, baseball was popular among the troops. This game of rounders first became known as baseball in 1744. An Englishman watched a game of it and went and wrote a poem, and he gave it the nickname baseball, okay? Well, in 1876, get this down. What's the other great event? I'm going to tell you. In 1876, what's the other great event besides what I'm going to tell you right now that happened in 1876? that shocked the nation, 1876. No? Well, that's pretty good, though. I guess that did shock the nation, but uh, something else, I may, maybe it shocked it even more than that. Out in the West, June 25th, 1876, Custer's last stand, Right? So the same th- that same year that Custer's taking it out there on the chin <laughs> at the Little Bighorn, courtesy of Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull and others, <coughs> the, Na- the National League was formed. The National League was formed. Hitler was in the National League, but that's another story for another day. No, Hitler was not in the National League. I'm just kidding. I'm not a National League. Do you understand these leagues? You understand there are two great leagues. There's the American League and the National League. And every year in October, the National League champion will play the American League champion in a little thing called the World Series. Yes, yes. How many how many games are there in the World Series? Up to seven. Up to seven. First team that wins how many? Four. Four is the champion of the world. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Well, anyway... Uh, though in 1876, the National League was formed. In 1882, the uh, American League was formed. And the Yankees, who are the greatest team in baseball ever, you know, they, how many, how many, hey, Boston, how many, how many World Series uh, has uh, New York won? A lot. A lot, yeah. Let, let me, let me, let me fill in the uh, 27. <laughs> And you know what? Your great, great your great, 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 great grandchildren will be working on their third set of teeth by the time Boston wins 27 World Series. You can write that down in your little notebook. I mean, they won A lot. Anyway, <laughs> this is this is history. We're not. Did we're talking it, about. Did Boston win one in 2018? Like 2018. Yeah, what are the last two numbers in 2018? Uh huh. That's your average. Anyway, don't criticize. <laughs> anyway, the first World Series was played in 1903. As much as it pains me, Boston and Pittsburgh played, and who won? Boston. Boston. And then Boston won again in 1912. And the same year, the Boston Red Sox moved into their brand new state. The the fans of Boston were so happy that their team had won two World Series, those World Series, that they built them a new stadium. There it is, Fenway Park. You see out there in left field, there's a map. You see out there in left field, the wall is much higher than there. And this is called the Green Monster. And to this day, to hit a home run over the Green Monster is uh, quite an accomplishment. Ted Williams, great Boston baseball player, made a routine out of knocking home runs 
out of Fenway Park. And by the way, that's the oldest active baseball stadium in America. Everybody else has torn down their old stadiums. I think that's a shame uh, and built, built new ones. But in 1912, uh, they, uh, and by the way, they move into their new park with the green monster and they won again. Boston won again. I want to be fair. Boston won again in 1918. And in 1918, they had a pitcher, sort of an outfielder in 1918. And this other team called New York wanted him. There he is, George Herman Ruth. George Herman Ruth. And the Yankees said, you know, they trade baseball players in the majors. Uh, New York said, we want that guy so bad, we'll give you two players for him. Boston said deal, and George Herman Ruth, who would later go on to become the babe, the bambino, the salt of the swat, uh, became a New York Yankee. And that was in 1918. When was the next time that the Boston Red Sox won a World Series? You got to get this time, Lynn. You got to get this time. 1918. When is the next time they won? 2004. Mm hmm. As I figure that, that's 86 years. When they came back 3 0 the series. What? When they came back down 3 0 in the series. Again. Well, it was about time. You, you know. weren't even alive, Caden. <laughs> I was. Anyway, let's bring it back. Bitter, painful memories. Anyway, 86 years. And if you talk to Boston fans, you know, they'll talk about the curse of the Bambino. They'll tell you the worst mistake we ever made was letting Babe Ruth go. And that's probably true. The worst mistake they ever made. Uh, they didn't win a World Series again for 86 years. 86 long years. Well, get this down. By 1920, baseball was called the national pastime. And it would hold that title, the national pastime, P-A-S-T-I-M-E past time, the national hobby, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and, that, and that would hold until the 1960s. And then I think college and professional football took over. By the way, who was the first African-American to play Major League Baseball? Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson. Nope, it was that guy during the Gilded Days. Write him down. Moses, Moses Fleetwood Walker. <laughs> he played in the American League in 1884 for a team that no longer exists called the Toledo Blue Stockings. The Toledo Blue Stockings in the American League. He was a catcher. And for the record, he's the first African-American during the Gilded Age. Okay, he's the first African-American in American history to play professional ball. Okay, let's see here. Uh, write this man down. We're in the middle of basketball season now. Dr. James Naismith, okay, who was a medical doctor. Dr. James Naismith, he was a medical doctor. He was a Presbyterian minister. He was a physical ed education teacher. This guy was busy. And the very first job he got out of school was at the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts. And he was put in charge of a group of teenage boys. Well, it worked out just fine in the summer because he could let them outside. But teenage boys, unsupervised, is the Titanic, oh, I don't know, on the order of the sinking of the Titanic in World War I and a bad plane crash. Uh, because in the wintertime, he had to bring them in. They couldn't go outside. You know, those Massachusetts winters are pretty bitter. And they were tearing the place apart. And his director at the YMCA told him this. He said... Uh, you've got 14 days to come up with a game that these boys can play inside instead of destroying this building. And in 14 days, two weeks, he invented basketball. He invented basketball. He wrote the original rules. The, the, the original, in the original rule book, I've never looked at a basketball rule book, but at the, it, the, it, was, it was 13 rules. And that's pretty simple. There it was. You put a peach basket up with a ball and you throw it in there. First, they didn't cut the bottom out of the peach basket. 
and they had to have a ladder next to it. And every time somebody scored, and, and by the way, they just had one basket. They didn't have two. When somebody scored, somebody had to climb up the ladder and put the ball back in play. And then somebody said, well, let's cut the bottom out and put another basket down there. And the game took off. It was revolutionized. And he started, uh, you know, when you talk about basketball powers, he started – the program, basketball program at the University of Kansas in Lawrence. He is buried in Lawrence, Kansas, okay? He's buried in Lawrence, Kansas. Well, I'll get this down. First college football game. First college football game. All this comes out of the Gilded Age. Oh, the first college football game was in 1869, four years after the Civil War. And we'll talk about it come tomorrow. 